antidepressants work. We just don't know precisely how. This week saw the publication of a high profile paper, a review of reviews, which isn't quite as fancy as it sounds, on the so-called chemical imbalance theory of depression. Surprise, surprise, they found that there is no evidence to support the idea of a chemical imbalance underpinning depression. Well, duh. But the media have taken this and they have run with it, often misreporting aspects of the paper to imply that therefore antidepressants don't work. And this is wrong and this is dangerous. If you're not going to give them the tablets, if you're not going to give them the pills, if you're saying to them, well, actually you can take them, but they're not really helping you, what would you say to those people going through this which would give them some sort of hope, some sort of light at the end of the tunnel? What I would say is that people come out of depression it may take a while and it may take a lot of support, but people do but come I know, through it. I know someone who didn't come out. No, you're, you're right. So it's like, yes, some people, you know, really sadly take their own lives. Because of that, it's created quite a stir among psychiatrists who have been quite quick to criticise the rationale, the methodology and the conclusions of the paper, with some of the authors perhaps being more driven through ideology than through a critical appraisal of the literature and an open mind when it comes to the science. Before we start though, have you seen this paper? Have you seen the reporting of this paper? Have you seen all the interviews that have happened on TV around the world on this? What are your thoughts about it? Leave them in the comments below. Let's see and compare your thoughts to it to mine by the end of this video, hey? Let's debunk this paper and let's talk about why serotonin alone doesn't explain depression, nor did science think it did. But even if it's not serotonin alone, that doesn't mean that antidepressants don't work. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Elliot Carthy. I am a psychiatrist in the UK and on my channel I make videos around mental health, mental illness, hopefully in a somewhat accessible way. Depression affects about one in seven of us. It usually follows this relapsing and remitting pattern where the symptoms will come. They'll have some form of treatment that will help those symptoms to remit and then some people might experience further episodes down the line. The more episodes somebody has, the more likely somebody is to have further episodes so it puts more of an, uh, an emphasis on the need for maintenance treatment, not just treatment for the acute episodes when they happen. Prevention really becomes much more key. And we in psychiatry, we follow what's called the biopsychosocial model of treatment. So the more biological treatments might include various types of antidepressants, then the psychological treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy is probably the most common one people have heard of, and then social interventions. And various combinations of these together can be and are a really effective treatment for depression. The symptoms that someone experiences with depression are variable. It's not a single disorder. Some people might experience profound guilt and hopelessness. Others get this overwhelming sense of emptiness and nothingness. Some people find their appetite goes <laughs> Some people find that it's really difficult to get off to sleep. Other people find their appetite goes way up and they're binge eating a lot of the time and they're tired all the time and sleeping all the time. There is no one size fits all model, which probably reflects lots of varying neurobiology that underpins the diverse way that symptoms manifest and will also explain to some degree why different people need different types of treatment depending on the difficulties they are experiencing. It's very much done on an individual basis. The fact the fancy word we call it is a heterogeneous disorder, which is basically a fancy medical way of saying it's a really variable condition. Now serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain, a chemical messenger that normally is involved in functions like mood and appetite among many other things, so it is probably involved to some degree in the brain disorder that underpins depression. Now this paper discusses something they call the chemical imbalance theory, this perception that depression is caused by low levels of serotonin in the brain and the antidepressant treatment, specifically SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, fluoxetine, citalopram, sertraline for example, work by correcting this deficit and that's why people's symptoms get better in depression. And this stems from something called the monoamine hypothesis, which was a pretty revolutionary scientific theory back in the 1960s, though as we'll come to discuss, outdated by today's knowledge. Prior to the late 1950s and the 1960s, we had very little in the way of treatments for most mental illnesses other than locking people away in asylums and very crude and primitive treatments, basically just sedating people with barbiturates and sometimes using various different chemical and physical forms of restraint. 
but the monoamine hypothesis changed things for depression. We had this antihypertensive drug called reserpine. This worked by blocking the way that certain what we call monoamines, so neurotransmitters made from a single amino acid, serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine, from being packaged properly in neurons and released and sending these messages throughout neurons. So if you don't have as much noradrenaline, then actually that diminishes your fight and flight response, which helps to reduce blood pressure. This drug was also used as a treatment for schizophrenia, where if you reduce the dopamine release, actually that could lead to a remission of symptoms of psychosis. So reserpine was effective for some things, but it also caused this syndrome resembling depression, both in humans that were taking it and then in animal models when it was studied as well. On the flip side, we had this new agent that was used to treat tuberculosis called ipronizid. Again, useful for TB, but it also caused people to become very elated very energetic with a syndrome akin to mania. And when they studied this drug, they found that one of its actions was to block an enzyme called monoamine oxidase that usually breaks down these monoamines like serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline. So then more of these neurotransmitters persist for longer, having more of a profound effect. So that was where the theory that low levels of these monoamines cause depression and high levels caused mania. And lo and behold, we developed the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, one of our first antidepressant treatments, they work, they're effective, they still are, albeit with usually pretty gnarly side effects. And then when we get to the 80s and to the early 90s, we developed the SSRIs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, Fluoxetine or Prozac was the first one, and we found that there's been a much wider availability of antidepressant treatment for more people ever since with this class of drugs that are not only effective, but, but for most people, pretty well tolerated. SSRIs work by blocking the recycling of serotonin, changing the balance of serotonin inside versus outside of the neuron that somehow goes on to be a really effective treatment for depression. So this is where the theory that low levels of serotonin cause depression and these are corrected by SSRIs and that's why they work as antidepressants comes from. Now, although in the last 30 years or so, we haven't developed a whole new range of effective antidepressant treatments, something that has evolved is a much greater greater understanding of the complexity of the brain disorder underpinning depression and how serotonin probably plays a part, but it's by no means as simple as just this low level of serotonin causes depression and that's corrected by antidepressants. Like a lot of areas of neuroscience, the more you study it, the more you realize how little you know. Current theories are, while well, there is this chemical change in serotonin from these drugs, the antidepressant effects are likely a downstream effect of this rather than being directly caused by this chemical change. So that might include changes in the way that neurons connect with each other in key parts of the brain involved in depression, a concept called synaptic plasticity that's mediated by this chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. There are other theories around altering the inflammatory response within the brain and the immune response within the brain that may be important. There are likely interactions with other neurotransmitter systems in the brain, like acetylcholine and noradrenaline and dopamine, which would also go some way to explain why there are effective antidepressant treatments that have nothing to do with serotonin. The noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor reboxetine and the noradrenaline and dopamine reuptake inhibitor bupropion would be two really common examples of that. So the diverse mechanisms that may underpin depression and the diverse ways that different antidepressant treatments work might explain the diverse ways in which depression can manifest itself in different individuals. And it's why, unlike what they did in this paper, all people with depression should not be lumped together as a single homogenous group. It's a heterogeneous disorder, not a homogenous disorder. So neuroscience does not believe in the monoamine hypothesis of depression as it was in the 1960s. It didn't believe that before this paper comes out. This paper changes nothing to do with that. But that doesn't mean that serotonin isn't involved somehow and in some way. And it certainly does not mean that antidepressant treatments do not work. Besides, this paper was not even set up to answer that question. It's a completely different question. There are hundreds of randomized controlled trials that confirm that antidepressants are superior to placebo at helping reduce the frequency, intensity, and duration of symptoms associated with depression. And there was one published response from a psychiatrist that stood out to me about this paper that I thought explained things really well. Many of us know that taking paracetamol can be helpful for headaches, and no one believes that headaches are caused by not enough paracetamol in the brain. 
Same goes for antidepressants. A major problem though, is that the complexity of the way that depression works and the unknowns around how depression works and the way that antidepressant treatment works isn't always communicated very well to patients and in the media. So I do agree that there is a common misconception among the general public, who are the people that take these antidepressants and are prescribed them, that depression is caused by low amounts of serotonin that's then corrected by the antidepressants that they're taking. I would have more respect for this paper if their premise was that the science isn't being reflected in the way that we communicate and disseminate information to the people that are actually taking these meds rather than claiming that outdated explanations reflect science as we know it today. As that's just not true. So this paper concludes by saying there is no evidence for the oversimplistic chemical imbalance hypothesis of depression. We know. We knew that before this paper came out, this paper changes nothing. But the extrapolation of this to claims that therefore antidepressants don't work, and this is basically being claimed by the authors, this is not just the media, this is the actual authors of this peer-reviewed paper, is really dangerous because it may make people less likely to continue taking this medication, increasing their risk of a relapse of a depressive disorder, a condition that we know can be life-threatening to many, and even if, even if it doesn't get to that point, experiencing more withdrawal symptoms if you abruptly stop these medications. So please, 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 please do not abruptly stop them without talking to your doctor first. Antidepressants work. We just don't know precisely how. So rather than this ideologically driven attempt to discredit a group of medications that can be life-saving and at the very least just helpful for so many people. Why not focus on the need for better science communication? Particularly, how can we help GPs be able to explain the complexity of depression and antidepressants to people they're prescribing this to? Because they're the most common people that prescribe it when they, you know, they've only got an eight minute appointment to deal with the entire problem. Maybe there is something good that will come out of this paper. Maybe the side effect of this paper is that maybe, maybe it'll encourage us to rethink how we explain this condition and its treatment to the patients that we're prescribing this medication to. Let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you for another video very soon. Thanks a lot, bye.